So while my transparencies are put up, let me already uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here and giving a complimentary view to what uh, Jim has been just telling about the long journey. Uh, this one? Yeah, uh, full screen. So, Jim was talking mainly about this here. I will concentrate more on the Atlas experiment. Now, I also thought, in particular, more for the younger colleagues here in the room, to go a little bit over the history of the LHC. So, uh, if I would have to say, by the way, in, in one transparency, something about the LHC experiment, then I would really say it's a very global project, which uh, brings together the collider, of course, brings together the experiments. A very important component is also the computing, and of course, all this was also motivated heavily by our Siri colleagues. And this has started more than 30 years ago, and uh, for me, it's a great privilege and pleasure actually to present now also uh, physics results like uh, this was for Jim. So let me give you a brief overview on the history really on the LHC. Well, the Large Hadron Collider was in the air already in the 70s, but it became more real when the lab was approved during the time of uh, Herwig Schopper as a director general with a large ring and a large diameter in also of the tunnel such that a machine, Hadron Collider, could eventually be put into this ring. But actually the more, most crucial years were really the early 1980s with the UA1, UA2 experiments, and the discovery of the W and Z, which showed that with such a Hadron Collider, one can actually do discovery physics. This here is an example of a Z0 from uh, the UI2 experiment, as I uh, come from that one. Jim has shown you from the UI1 experiment. But so the LHC tunnel, uh, Professor Rubio has already shown you this 27 kilometer ring with the uh, location of the Atlas and CMS experiments, which are here in the focus for the Higgs boson uh, discovery. So how did it start really? For the community, this I would say was in 84, when there was a workshop in Lausanne, where the machine people and the experimentalists came together and brainstorm for the first time, really, uh, the project. Some R&D started, but then the crucial milestone, and I will try to give some of this historical milestone, I think was 1987, when in the Latville uh, workshop, which was set up by Carlo Rubia's Long Range Planning Committee, we actually discussed the merits of Hadron Collider versus, already at that time, versus E plus C e minus Collider. And uh, just to show you some historical uh, evaluation of the potential of a LHC at that time, this was how we were thinking a Higgs signal at 400 GV would uh, be visible over the background. So that is when really the dream uh, became more real, the conclusion of uh, the long range planning committee was, I will say this later, that the Hadron Collider would be the right thing. Let me also show you from uh, the very old collection of Transparency One, which must be around 87 in fact, how optimistic we were namely 
we were thinking that, okay, detector and machine R&D something until 92, and then uh, construction of the detectors and assembly of the detectors until 97, and then concurrent operation commissioning of the machine. Of course, we all know that this was a bit too optimistic, but on the other hand, I think it was very essential to have uh, this enthusiasm for the machine to get it and the experiment to get them all together. So next crucial milestone was really in 91, and of course, uh, Carlo knows better than anybody else. It's thanks to his great push that the council uh, decided, made the statement that the LHG is the right machine. And uh, then it took two more years to make a formal proposal to council. And uh, this uh, proposal was put forward by the then new Director General Chris Levin Smith, who, because of financial difficulties, proposed a machine which one probably could not have built, namely a missing uh, magnet machine. And I remember well, again, the historical transparency. We were asked at that time to provide uh, cross-section estimates what you could do actually with a lower energy and not the 14 TV. Well, this somehow convinced council actually to approve the machine in a two-stage construction at the end of uh, 94. But the understanding was really that uh, this plan would be modified if further resources would be found from non-member states, and this was the case. Uh, resources were found in Japan, Russia, India, Canada, and the US. And uh, also Israel, by the way, contributed all along uh, the, this program. And so finally, the machine as we know it now was approved in 96 in a single stage. And at that time, the idea was it would be completed in 2005. Uh, a few el elements on the machine, a few. Of course, the core element was really the uh, dipole magnets, 8.4 Tesla magnets operated at 1.9 Kelvin. We see here uh, the magnets installed during the installation in uh, the tunnel. They are some 15 meter long. These are the two beam channels where the beams go opposite to each other. Here a picture of the uh, project leader of the LHC construction of Lynn Evans. Then the magnet construction and installation, that was a very long story. And in fact, the last of the dipoles was uh, brought down into the tunnel and then in its position in uh, spring 207. And if you look here at the time scale, this is January 201 to January 208. So this was this point here, installation of the last uh, cryo magnet. But as you can see, it was a long learning curve to build the magnets and then to build them over several years. The other elements, just to mention them briefly, at one point, point four, are the radio frequency uh, accelerators for the beams, where the beam get every time, 11,000 times a second, every time a little kick during the uh, acceleration and a small kick to keep them uh, bunched during the operation. And near the experiments, there are the focusing elements, quadrupoles, in order to reach the high luminosity uh, interaction regions. 
these are examples of contribution from non-member states uh, to the project, as you can see here from Fermilab and uh, KEK, Japan. Of course, the machine also uh, relies on the infrastructure, all the injectors uh, of the CERN accelerator uh, chain. And uh, finally, they are injected into the LHC ring and brought into collision. Again, for the, just for the non-expert, the uh, events we are looking for are already there. Typically, 1 in 10 to the 13 only gives us, we knew, a Higgs uh, particle in a uh, detectable final state. So clearly, uh, this needed very sophisticated instruments to find them. So what happened on the, in the instrumental side then after the Latwil workshop, which I mentioned before, well, there were other workshops where experimental ideas were worked out more and more uh, concretely. And this culminated, in a way, in the uh, 92 in spring at the Avion meeting where several uh, general purpose and also uh, dedicated experiments were proposed. And that was the time when Atlas and CMS uh, were really born. They uh, submitted then uh, letters of intent to the uh, LHC uh, committee. Just for your amusement, I think it was, uh, we take it for, for granted now that we have these very sophisticated detectors, but that was not uh, clear that this could be done. And it, there was quite a long learning process. And uh, this is uh, uh, transparency from the mid 80s, where one was arguing actually that one should do more than just an iron ball, which could have found the Higgs, but more sophisticated uh, signatures have to be brought in. Of course, making the experiments more complex. And uh, I remember well that there was a lot of discussion about, about that. So the, as I said, the birth of Atlas and of CMS equally, that was in 92, actually Atlas coming out of merging of two of the experiments, pre-experiments which were proposed in Evian. And then the experiments uh, worked out what is called the technical proposals over several years. And uh, this process came to a happy end for CMS and Atlas at the end of uh, 95. This was the official leak from the LHCC referees in the case for, for Atlas telling us that, OK, the committee is finally happy to give you uh, the green light. Jim has already mentioned these collaborations are really world-spanning uh, enterprises. This is the map of uh, the Atlas experiment, which uh, includes 39 countries from highly industrialized uh, regions, but also from uh, regions where uh, development still is uh, progressing. And it was always the spirit of these experiments to welcome really uh, all groups who want really to contribute and are motivated. These are the numbers very similar to what uh, Jim has given in the case here for Atlas. So Atlas is installed in an underground cavern at point one. This is a big cavern. I will show you some picture uh, about 50 five meter long along the beam, about 35 uh, meter in height. The ground is about at minus 100 meters. And that's a picture of uh, the excavation after about five years of excavation in 2003. And uh, I will just 
also show you one or two uh, engineering examples what it really meant. I take very big engineering in this case, the Atlas uh, magnet uh, system, the toroid. It's a superconducting uh, toroid system with, uh, you see the, the coils, there are eight, an eight fold symmetry, eight coils, toroid, because the field then is around uh, this. Has, for example, something like 80 kilometers of supraconductor. In order to build this beast, one went to a uh, prototyping phase. We built a first coil which was only about eight meters long, five meters in the right direction, and this was then operated up to the 20 kiloamps as uh, was foreseen. Now the real ones, as you can see, they, are, they were really quite big, and uh, they were then installed in 2004 and 2005. So this took one year to install the toroid, leading to this picture which many of you have seen. We are looking here along the beam, and uh, the field, magnetic field is like that. And this is another example of, of uh, heavy equipment which was built. This is the hadronic calorimeter in the barrel, the lower part. <clears throat> the modules were actually built in uh, Dubna and then uh, instrumented at CERN and finally brought to 0.1 and lowered in the pit. Other milestone 207, when uh, the magnet was dressed up with muon chambers, end cap calorimeters, and in the detector space ready to receive the high tech in the detector. And maybe the last of these uh, pictures show 2008, uh, Peter Hicks was visiting the experiment. Uh, we see here actually the uh, muon detectors in the end caps. I can just mention, as I see Eliezer here, these were built these particular ones in Israel, Japan, and China. Now, telling the story of the LHC, of course, one should also mention that not everything went completely smoothly. There was an incident just after the first startup on the 19th of September that a joint between superconducting uh, connections between two dipoles actually failed. A helium, this uh, arc made, uh, punctured the helium lines, helium release, expansion, and a lot of collateral damage. And this meant a 15 month uh, repair period. The experiments during that time took a lot of cosmic rays and actually readied really the experiments to be uh, ready then in 2009. 209, so 23rd of November, people were very anxious what will happen as there was a new turn on, okay? Great happiness because they saw the first uh, collisions. So that's when really the uh, collision started first at uh, injection energy and then in the spring of uh, the year after at uh, the first 7 TB and then uh, in 2012 at uh, ATV. So this is the data which was collected in run one. About two times 10 to the 15 collisions were examined. So that is the typical data set which uh, was available for run one. One can also note that about 95% of the uh, delivered collisions were really uh, examined by the experiments. Uh, the good functioning of the machine actually put quite a lot of uh, challenges. Jim mentioned some. Here is a picture of the typical number of collisions happening during a bunch crossing. So with tails up to 50 or so events per bunch crossing, more uh, average typical was 25 or so. This year, we had a somewhat 
slow startup now at 13 TV, as you can see. And uh, we have recorded about four uh, inverse femtobahn. That means really much less than what was available from run one. Another ingredient to the LHC project is really the computing. And I just want to say uh, two words about that. The data is transferred from the experiment to what is called a level one trigger. And then uh, after level one selection, typically at the order of 100 uh, kilohertz, the data is put into computer farms, finally into the tier zero center at CERN and shipped to the uh, whole collaboration world. Uh, in fact, this was developed in parallel to building the machine and the experiments, namely the uh, worldwide computing grid. And the worldwide computing grid was functioning really uh, beautifully. That's thanks to this uh, infrastructure that we actually can show already data from uh, which we were taken just a couple of weeks or months ago. Just to give you a, an impression, this is over the years, the amount of data which was treated at the tier zero and then uh, shipped to the lower tier uh, computer centers, it reached uh, something like 30, 40 uh, petabyte for 2015. So then you see here the 2012 run with 27 petabyte and so on. Um, let me give you a few examples of, of the physics. Again, uh, similar as Jim, leading to our understanding of the detectors, but also to, to uh, make very interesting measurement in itself. And one of the most basic one, of course, is to measure the total cross-section. And uh, this uh, has been done in particular by two experiments, one which is called uh, TOTEM, uh, and also by the ATLAS experiment. So this is the total cross-section measurements. These are some cosmic ray uh, data. And this is the elastic uh, cross-section. And this has been uh, now repeated in a preliminary form also at 13 TV. And uh, well, we see the expected rise, of course, the the data is by far not yet as precise as the lower uh, the 7 and the 8 TV data. But this will come. The uh, bread and butter physics, so to speak, in a way, on hard collisions at the LHC are uh, jet physics. This is an example of a two-jet event from uh, run one with a die jet mass of 4.7 uh, TV. A lot of uh, QCD physics is done on uh, this field. Maybe just again, to be a bit historical, I'll just show you the inclusive cross sections actually over several generations of uh, colliders. The P by P collider, then uh, the Tevatron, and this was run one uh, at the LHC, both Atlas and the CMS data. So extending now to uh, several TV, in fact. The other uh, benchmark are the W and Z production. And uh, what I show you here are just some small, relatively small data samples to show the cleanness of, for example, the uh, transverse mass for the W or the Z peak. And in fact, you have to go to a logarithmic scale even to see uh, the backgrounds. I think it's uh, for those who were in uh, UI1, UI2, it's, it's like a dream to have uh, such beautiful data remembering, for example, the uh, very, very uh, famous discovery plot of the W uh, 
and here of the WNC plots from the first runs at the P by P collider some 30 years ago. So finally, these are then comparing the cross sections now from the UI1, UI2, CDF, D0, then the LHC 7, 8, and 9, and now at 13 uh, TV compared to the uh, QCD expectation. Another such example, the uh, TT bar uh, pair production cross section uh, from a joint uh, working group, which CMS and Atlas have on uh, top physics. You see here the first measurements at 13 TB for this process. I show you a different way of comparing many, many standard model measurements with uh, the theoretical predictions. Okay, these are over, spanning over many orders of magnitude. Maybe it's easier to look here at the ratio data over theory and you see uh, excellent agreement. And I think this is really a great triumph of uh, the standard model. And it is of course also a uh, kind of guarantee that we understand the experiments and that we can now uh, be confident looking at, at new physics. Uh, another uh, example of cross-section measurements including and showing more explicitly now 13 TV data here again f over many orders of magnitude in cross-section for including also for example the CZ pair production and so on. So we are ready for the Higgs and uh, Jim has already uh, told you how happy the experiments were when uh, after the discovery, the Nobel Committee also included really the experiments in the citation. So let me just very briefly show uh, some data. First on the Higgs in gamma gamma, that's how it looks like, for example, in the Atlas experiment with the fine, fine grained liquid argon uh, calorimeter. And uh, these are now the data for the full run one, putting side by side Atlas and CMS. Similarly, the data for the four leptons, muons and electrons, side by side the Atlas data with the full run one uh, statistics and the CMS. So one of the questions of course, there were other channels, and Jim has shown one example or two examples, which are more, much more sophisticated analysis. But one can then make a, a general uh, statistical analysis, putting all these channels together, and asking the question, what is the probability that the background would have fluctuated to give uh, these uh, signals? And uh, for Atlas alone, this is with the run one data, the probability 10 to the minus 23 of the order of 10 sigma. So no doubt that there is a, a new resonance found. What is the mass? I mean, the mass has been determined using the uh, gamma gamma and four lepton channels and the whole uh, work really to determine the mass is to determine the calibration. And the calibration on the electromagnetic scale has been checked using known masses from shapes i and z in E plus e minus decays. And look at the scale here. This is 0 0.005, so half a percent. Uh, so clearly the mass scale is uh, very precisely known. Similarly, for the muons, where in addition one used also the uh, upsilon uh, mu plus mu minus signals. And taking just the mass measurements from Atlas alone in the gamma gamma and uh, four lepton, 
these were the values. And I remember there was quite some excitement because, OK, these values are somewhat two sigma apart. But uh, within two sigma, this, this happens. And that's the, that's the value. Now, the two experiments have actually measured uh, and analyzed together the data, combined it, not just taken the value and combined it, but really made an analysis. And uh, this here shows you the full, the full uh, result of that. So as you can see, everything is uh, perfectly well compatible within the statistics. And in fact, I think it's remarkable that this mass is already measured with a 0.2% uh, accuracy. By the way, I also advise our theory friends not to talk about the Higgs at 126. I don't see any reason why we should not take the, the more round number of 125. So a, a few fingerprints, again, from common analysis of ATLAS and CMS. Well, Jim has already mentioned the signal strengths in the different uh, decay modes, gamma, gamma, CC, WW, tau, tau, B, BB. You see the results from Atlas CMS and then in black, the common, uh, common uh, analysis. And the overall, overall measurement at this stage for mu is within 10% to that what one expects from the standard model. More sophisticated analysis, where however one now hits clearly already the statistical limits, is to look at the uh, production processes to see, in fact, the couplings to bosons, taking the vector boson fusion process and the associated production, again, normalizing it to what one would expect from standard model. And one can compare and make even the double ratio to the loop production to fermions, in particular to the top, which is the heaviest one, in the normal gluon fusion production process and in the associated production with TT bar. And as you can see, within this double ratio, which again, for standard model, you would expect 1.0. There, the measurement, of course, is very limited at this stage by the statistics. Um, an analysis has been made, again, on the common data on the uh, coupling strengths, which should, in these variables, scale uh, for a standard model Higgs. This is the present day. Uh, measurements and again within the limited statistics I think this goes along what is predicted by the standard model. Furthermore an important test is of course to assign its spin parity which should be zero plus. This uh, zero plus hypothesis has been tested statistically against many other uh, assignments by analyzing the uh, angular distributions, essentially, angular variables of uh, these decays. And one can see that in each case, there is a clear preference for the zero plus uh, assignment. In fact, globally, one can say that the uh, spin parity assignment, which are alternative to that, are disfavored by more than 99.9%. I would like to show you this transparency, which uh, historically, I think, should, should have some, it's interesting, because there was a long, as I said, there was a long discussion about the experiments. Finally, ATLAS and CMS are very complementary technologies. And uh, one, I mean, we were always threatened, uh, well, um, maybe one doesn't work or something like that. That's why we want us 
uh, the Atlas people to have CMS as a competitor and, and vice versa. That was a typical discussion in the, in the LHCC. And as one can see, actually, these complementary technologies performed uh, very equivalently and very well. Both experiments uh, did very well. These are the expected significance of both experiments in these channels for the Higgs uh, measurements. Uh, and these are the observed ones. And then you can see this is all very, uh, they, are, they are both doing the job very well and give, of course, confidence that the results are correct. And again, if I take a historical comparison, in fact, once the LHC worked, then the result came very fast. That is what, in 99, one was thinking uh, to need at 14 uh, TV with 100 inverse femtobahn as, as uh, this is the significance plotted in that way. And uh, you can see already then in summer 2012, one reached uh, with this data sample, actually the six sigma uh, significance. So uh, just to show you, uh, to comment a little bit about uh, how much time do we do I have? Five minutes, okay. About the beyond standard music, uh, physics, standard model physics. Well, Jim mentioned uh, supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, there are really many, many analyses. Well, one of the, most of these analyses, not all, rely on detecting missing transverse energy. And so the basic thing is that you look above, uh, about enhancements above the standard model in variables which are dominated by the missing transverse energy. I will not show you uh, much data about that, but just tell you that this is the equivalent uh, summary table of many analyses. And as you can see in these different models, uh, well, the green bars show which mass range ranges are excluded. Now, Atlas has made an, uh, an attempt to uh, give you a global picture by combining all these different measurements, taking a SUSI parameter uh, space of something like uh, 20 variables or so, and making a grid varying these, uh, these uh, parameters, and then seeing which are the regions where one would always find one of these analyses which excludes uh, the masses for, well, Ruinos, stops, spotums, and so on. And where it is dark, it gives an indication where it is dark, there clearly uh, you never find a parameter configuration which uh, we could not exclude, where it is uh, light, red, or light, okay, you see the probability, you see that still a lot is not excluded. So just uh, an optical way to say that th there is still a lot of room for uh, supersymmetry. Just to show you that, of course, there will be a, a, a huge step now, thanks to the higher energy in the run two, I give you one example, that is uh, the production of gluino pairs decaying into, uh, uh, well, depending which channel you take. In the end, you have always uh, tops or Bs and the lightest supersymmetric particle. This is a very direct uh, analysis. Again, you look at the ET, missing ET spectrum. And you can see that already with something like 3.3 inverse femtobahn, these are the limit 
compared to what has been excluded in run one. I will skip the W prime and C prime. Jim has already shown you that. And uh, just show you the data for the search for the die jet uh, masses. Again, with the, the new data, of course, uh, you can see immediately that you start probing masses up to six or so uh, TV, and you can fit the data with uh, smooth functions and then look for hunting for bumps. There are uh, tools doing this, and you can, depending on the models and so, for example, I excited quarks or so, you can already with this data set limits of the order of four uh, TV. Or you can look at uh, compositeness, something we already did in the old time at UI1, UI2, but now uh, looking at the angular distributions like, like in the old times, seeing for deviations and can set limits of the order of up to 17 TV or so on this uh, composite scale. So there are many such exotic analyses which are done. Again, I have no time to tell you about uh, the uh, details. Now let me also end with what everybody asks. Indeed, we were looking at many uh, distributions, of course, in this uh, search in the searches with the new data. And let me just pick out the Higgs in gamma gamma Higgs in quotient mark in gamma gamma uh, search. Just as a reminder, the published uh, data from run one, uh, which was shown by Atlas, was shown up to 600 GV, clearly seeing uh, no excess. Well, the only excess seeing was seen at 125. GB. So you have already seen this plot by uh, many of the colleagues showing that from uh, the new data. This is the, the famous fluctuation, I would say, enhancement at uh, 750 GB. Just to tell you the, the purity of the signal is about 90%. Uh, so there is some background, but the photons are really pure. One can fit a analytic function again and then uh, display the data minus the fitted background, as it is done here. Or analyze that again, what, what are the, the fluctuations. Now, the fluctuations. If you look locally, Jim showed that in our case would be 3.6 sigma under the assumption that it's a narrow uh, resonance. But of course, one has to take into account uh, the uh, look elsewhere effect. This was established to be between 200 GV and 2 TV. Uh, before unblinding actually the data, and then the global significance only is uh, two sigma. And as Jim pointed out, of course, we're looking at many, many uh, other distributions. So I think for an experimentalist, there is really no reason to get overexcited in spite of the more than 200 uh, theory papers which have already been done. On the other hand, of course, it's, it's a great motivation to look forward uh, to this year's data, which we should just be patient, I think. Second last transparency. Uh, we are just having had the startup uh, run, really, at 2015 at 13 TV. We are now working towards upgrading the detector in phase one for 2019, when we will have collected something like maybe 150 inverse femtobarn, and then continue run 
until 2023, where we should accumulate 300 inverse femtoban. Yeah, this is the same number as is uh, planned for CMS. And then we will go into a two and a half year shutdown to upgrade really in a very major way the detectors. And I think sometimes people don't realize we are really building almost half or so of the order of half of the, of the experiments, what we did initially. So it's a big construction uh, effort uh, going on. OK, that brings me just to the end that I really think the journey into new physics territory has only just begun. And uh, for sure, exciting times are ahead of us. Thank you. So, uh, one, a statistics question. Both detectors see this bump. In that case, the look elsewhere effect should not be applied to at least one experiment. So, could you discuss, you know, the best estimate of both experiments for this effect? And two, uh, you said you didn't say much about these events, and you've now been looking at whether there's anything special about them. Is there anything special about these events? In the back, you know, do they differ from the background? Well, as I have the microphone, let me just answer the, the first. Well, the second question, there are not so many events, so to see really a difference it would have to be very striking, and, and it is not. That has been not. The first question, I do not know really a, a, a numerical answer to that. Of, of course, we realize that 750, 760 is very, very close by. Uh, I, I cannot give you a numerical estimate of the, of the chance. Because I think it's, it's pushing too far to go. We just need more data, and then we, we will see. Again, non-numerically, but uh, there are lots of distributions we look at. And those, uh, those dips occur in all of them. And uh, it's not a surprise that at some point, one of them lines up. Now, I think we'll have to work out the probability of what we've done. So there's a look elsewhere effect, not on these plots, but the whole experiment is wrong the whole two experiments. At some point, uh, we look at lots of uh, mass distributions, like dye jets, dye bosons, dye many different types of objects. So I, I wouldn't read very much into it. And I think statistically, it's probably not correct to be thinking that way either. I have a feeling. And I'll have to think about that. Carla, you had a question? Thank you. Well, I have a, a short comment about uh, especially um, the beginning of everything was, of course, this Long Range Planning Committee, uh, which I would like to mention uh, for a very simple reason, because it was a very small group of people, and one of the, the theorists who really helped us was Abdul Salam. So Abdul Salam was, in fact, the main uh, motivator of the uh, present uh, development of uh, lab uh, superconduct superconducting and also of LHC and therefore. Now, let me also mention to you who are the other people present to this committee, which is five people over there. There was uh, Simon van der Meer, which is no longer with us. There was Pierre Dariula, which was the year two experiment. Then there was Abdul Salam, who was in charge. And there was something which was there also as well helping us. So that was a time, very difficult times, so of this kind of fighting between SSC and LHC, which is going on in itself. But there, uh, in fact, we had. The first choice was whether you had to deal with the electron positron machine, and then it was a click story, which is still going on now, or whether it should be a hadron machine. And one of the decisions was made there that the hadron collider in the lab tunnel was the right thing to do. 
uh, is a choice. The second problem was the fact that he wanted to have superconductivity uh, applied to LEP at that time. And as you remember, LEP was done initially for the Z0, it was ordinary cavities, and then the superconducting and were developed. By the way, at that time, we proposed to have all the four super, uh, uh, rings of uh, LH, uh, LEP uh, with superconductivity, which would have brought you the X particle at LEP. Because then it was Hilliwell and Smith that several years later, under the excitement for the uh, LHC, which was supposed to come earlier than it did, actually, at that time he gave up the last, the fourth uh, segment of uh, superconductivity. And therefore, uh, we had to wait for the LHC to discover the Higgs. But he could have done it also at, uh, at, at LAP using the full extent of the radio frequency system. OK, these are the comments which I, I think is worthwhile mentioning. I would like to underline the fact that, in fact, Salam has been, at that time, at CERN, one of the major uh, supporters and defenders, and really helped us to build up a solution, which, you, in fact, really set the frame for the story of CERN for the remaining 30 years. I, uh, I have a question on this uh, uh, Highland Nursery, uh, let's see, do we start it? Uh, yeah, 2023, is it? Uh, uh, on the side, I, I understand you touch on the mostly insertion uh, area. And uh, I'm not quite uh, clear what, uh, what would be the major uh, sort of uh, uh, changes uh, on the detectors, uh, uh, both outlets uh, and the CMS, and uh, what would be the uh, sort of uh, cost estimate uh, for the uh, insertion area and also for each detector? I would appreciate a simple answer. Yeah, I think I pointed out that uh, the inner trackers have to change, so the silicon detectors. So it's 200 square meters of silicon, so it will be 10 times more granular. Uh, in the case... Will you speak a little bit louder? I, louder. I have some hearing difficulty. Ah, okay. Now, as I said in my talk, uh, the, there are three things which we will... principal things in CMS. One is the central tracker, which is made of silicon, and it will have 10 times more granular, so 10 times more channels. Uh, new pixel detectors. And in the end caps, a new calorimeter, which will be based on silicon detectors as well, 600 square meters of it. And uh, the third thing is the triggering system, which will also change. And that requires changes of the electronics in some of the areas. And the, the budgeting that we have uh, given, which uh, we uh, proved to move forward to, is uh, in the range between uh, 240 to 270 million Swiss francs, which is oh. where the factor two comes well, from uh, that uh, Peter was mentioning. Uh, this is per experiment. <laughs> Per experiment. No, I'm in total cost estimate. Uh, for the experiments, you can add uh, 270 or 250, let's say 500, for the two experiments. As I said, that's roughly a factor two compared to the uh, initial detective. So for us, uh, this is what it is. It's, it, I mean, the main change is really the inner detectors that uh, we both have to do. And then uh, there is a lot of electronics to be changed. In the, uh, that can trigger electronics. We already, for phase one, uh, changing, for example, the innermost uh, muon station, uh, which, is not, which is a big effort also. But that will already be installed in 2019. You know anything about the insertion area? Insertion devices? I think the, the, uh, the final uh, focusing quadrupoles will be changed, yes. Uh, there, there are 11 Tesla uh, new types of uh, superconductor magnets. Well, it will be niobium tin magnets yeah, that I know. which are being developed. So that's one of the big, uh, the big mm -hmm. parts. And it's uh, of the order of one uh, billion Swiss francs, the overall infrastructure change for, uh, for the machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, it's it's <laughs> the order. I give you the order of magnitude. Right. Uh, this uh, question is about uh, measuring the uh, Higgs self-coupling. And uh, so, I mean, apart from uh, the interest in the high lum luminosity, which is uh, clearly uh, motivated by searches for beyond the standard model physics, but still the standard model uh, actually, in particular, the Higgs potential remains to be tested. And the question is, uh, what will it take at the LHC to measure, let's say, the triple Higgs coupling? I, the number that I gave in my transparencies is 30% is what current uh, simulations give us. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I suspect we need to do more work in understanding uh, how we're going to do it. So 30% is the preliminary simulations, which are indi indicative of 3,000 inputs femtobarks, by the way. Yeah, just so that's a similar answer from for the ATLAS experiment. Let me just point out, it's not, of course, the, the triple Higgs coupling, a first view on that is uh, one of the major goals, but not the only one in, in the Higgs sector. It's also to have a, a very significant measurement of the Higgs in mu plus mu minus. Right. It's to measure the TT bar Higgs, uh, where then the Higgs in gamma gamma or or, the, right. or BB bar, and so so there's a there's a whole spectrum of uh, uh, of Higgs coupling measurements also. Right. There's one other thing which I could add. I think uh, Kezo mentioned that yesterday in his talk. Uh, when we do these ratios, for example, take a gamma gamma ratio to something else, then the gamma gamma has a very interesting aspect to it because it decays through a loop, and that loop has uh, other yeah. possible uh, particles in there, and it's very sensitive to that. So that measurement. Uh, uh, in a ratio, it can be quite precise, but you need statistics for that. That's right. where I think the uh, even the 1,000 or two in a thousand branching when we have produced 100 million, it becomes sizable. So that's mm -hmm. uh, another area that we should be investigating. And for that, those kind of things, we also need to help from our theoretical friends to yeah, make the calculations. Yeah, yeah. Um, shouldn't be forgotten. If I may ask um, a supplementary question, are you uh, prepared to take questions on 750 GV? <laughs> I mean, I, a question which uh, I have not uh, been uh, sure about is, I mean, have you looked at digets or was your, uh, I mean, your cut such that you excluded the 750 GeV uh, uh, measurements in the digets? Uh, I think that we, we don't, at least uh, uh, in CMS I can say we've looked at other places like dileptons, uh, uh, digets. Uh, I have to think about that, uh, and dibosons, and we haven't really seen. But the other thing to remember is that uh, in the diphoton, the width is actually almost consistent with the mass resolution, perhaps slightly wider. So it's a narrowish thing. And when yeah. you get to digets, it'll be if the number of events we're looking at, it'll be completely washed out. So you wouldn't see it. It's like uh, the Higgs to uh, gamma gamma or ZZ. We didn't see it in the WW until much later, yeah. kind of stuff. So it's not something which uh, uh, you'd actually see it. So uh, it's not surprising that you're not seeing it. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I uh, add something to to Please. that? Of course, one of the obvious things to look is also to gamma z right. decay. Oh yes. Now, however, you should again realize that we have by far not enough uh, data for that because the z, of course, you pay the the branching ratio uh, price. It's a very low branching ratio into, into lepton pairs. So th these type of things are being looked at, but it's, it's way too early to. Okay. We, we certainly haven't seen anything, otherwise we would have said it. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Well, as a simple question, you have uh, talked about the 750 GeV events. You indicated a gamma gamma process, and you give them some peak and values. We understand all those numbers. But what about the? Can you give us a number for the four lepton channel? Because after all, if it goes gamma gamma, it should be also to go in W and Z objects. Now, do you have a number? Can you say what is the ratio between gamma gamma and or a limit? to gamma gamma or uh, for uh, W, uh, Z objects. Do you have those numbers? 
perhaps uh, the way I can answer this uh, question is that, uh, for example, in the case of the standard model Higgs, in the case of the standard model Higgs boson, there were predictions as to what the ratios should be. And it was... Uh, no, I'm not talking about theory. I'm asking experimentally. Experimentally, uh, for, if you uh, want, as Peter has just mentioned, uh, you look for gamma Z, and Z you'd pay the price of a uh, factor of 30 because of Z plus Z minus in there. What and so, gamma? Which is the factor? So ratio between uh, gamma gamma and Ws. So if I take... Z, example, what is the number? Yeah. The numbers of events we're talking about is order of 10. Order of 10? Yeah, order of 10. So if you now put a gamma Z, for example, instead of a gamma gamma, then you pay the price, uh, if it's equal, let's say, you pay the price factor 30. So you won't see it yet. That's what it Peter would seem to me that any presentation, even provisional on these subjects, will also give us some idea about what are the expectations from the point of view of pure physics, experimental physics, for other channels. And since the, the W pairs, in any case, has to be fundamental as well, because electroweak interactions properties, those numbers will be of some value. And I think it would be worthwhile if they're better explained and given. Uh, I, I think when you say expectation, uh, I don't know the expectation. I wouldn't if know you the don't have any expectation, then we can close down and go home. Yes. No, in the sense that uh, it depends on what the theory you put in there is. Yeah, it's a different guy. I have asked I mean, a very simple question. What is the experimental limit for productions of W and Z0 channels yeah. in association with a 750 GV gamma ray line? That's the question. Yeah, we don't see anything. Well, you don't have this answer. Okay, thank you.